Well, good morning, everyone, and welcome to our webinar. Uh, I'm Harv Allen with the OAS Cluster Initiative, and uh, uh, before we start, uh, we'd just like to say again, thank you for being with us this morning. We hope you guys are having a great fall right now, and we have several people that are starting to um, come in from our attendees. We have uh, uh, a lot of attendees today, which is a great uh, sign, and I know there's a great interest in the aerospace industry here in Oklahoma. And, uh, and especially Oklahoma City, and we have a lot of great things going on in here in the state of Oklahoma. And so uh, I just want to tell you a couple of things before we get started. Uh, this, is a, uh, this is a webinar that is hosted by the UAS Cluster Initiative, and uh, we are under a contract with the Small Business Administration to help grow the UAS industry here in Oklahoma, uh, Kansas, and, and uh, throughout the region. And so uh, we are appreciative of the SBA uh, providing the, that those contract fund supports to do that work. And we are so pleased that we were able to do that. Um, I'd like to introduce to you, this is a, a program that's gonna be also hosted by uh, the Oklahoma City Chamber, the Greater Oklahoma City Chamber. And uh, they do a great job here in Oklahoma City of bringing folks in from all over the, really all over the world to uh, relocate here or set up shop here in Oklahoma City. And we're very appreciative of the work they do and the partnership that they have here with us with the UAS Cluster Initiative. Uh, as we go along through this uh, webinar, we would like to remind you too that if you'd like to ask a question that you had the chat function, they're available to you where you can write your questions. And also there is a, uh, the question and answer um, function as well. So you have two avenues to ask questions and we invite, invite you and encourage you to do that. And we'll send you reminders throughout the, the, the presentations to uh, use the chat and, and the question and answer function. So um, without further ado, I'd like to introduce uh, uh, Jeff Seymour. Jeff Seymour is going to be our moderator for the uh, webinar today. And uh, the, the webinar, if you, in case you don't already know it, is how federal installations serve as catalysts for the dynamic Oklahoma City Aerospace Hub. And I've already given you kind of a, 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 you know, a pre uh, setting of what that's all about, and uh, we are so thrilled to have Jeff and his team involved with this. And Jeff Seymour is the uh, uh, serves as executive vice president for economic development for the Greater Oklahoma City Chamber. So, Jeff, thank you for being here with us. Thank you for uh, accepting the role of a moderator, and uh, we're looking forward to the next hour. Jeff, I'll turn it over to you. Thank you, Harv. Thanks for that kind introduction. We're really excited about the partnership we have with the UAS Cluster Initiative on many fronts. Um, and excited about this conversation today. What we really wanted to do was have an opportunity to really talk and do a deeper dive into the ecosystem that Oklahoma City continues to create around uh, the aerospace cluster and the dynamic pieces of that. And as many people probably on this call know, a lot of that work centers around the clusters that currently exist around our federal installations. Um, and so what we wanted to do is have an opportunity to hear from some of the folks that have really been impacted by that uh, hear about that infrastructure, hear about their decision making, and also hear from uh, some of the folks that have relocated here to be part of that bigger story and initiative. So really excited about this. We want this to be a chance for, for back and forth. Um, obviously, as part of said, please uh, drop questions in the chat box. I'll be watching that, as will others, and we'll make sure that we get a lot of good questions answered as we go. So uh, one thing I did want to do, um, in addition to thanking Harv, is also just thank our panelists for being here today. They've taken time out of their very busy schedule to participate in this conversation. So I wanna thank each of you before we get started. Um, what I'm gonna do just to open up the webinar is give you just a quick overview, 30,000 foot overview of Oklahoma City and about the ecosystem. And then we'll use that to transition into a conversation with each of our individual panelists. So I'm gonna do a quick screen share and hopefully everybody can see my see my slides here. So from an Oklahoma City perspective, um, we're actually a, a fairly large region. We as an organization represent a 10 county regional area, including and surrounding Oklahoma City. That 10 county regional area is about 1.5 million people with a labor force of given, give or take 750,000 people. Uh, we're also one of the faster growing regions in the nation, part of the I-35 corridor. Um, and we grow at about two times the national average, which has been a real boon to our economic standing. Um, from, a, from a regional economic perspective, we're a really diverse region, and we're going to talk about, obviously, the growth in the aerospace sector as part of the conversation today. But, you know, a lot of people that say Oklahoma, Oklahoma City, 
you must just be oil and gas and, and uh, or ag or something like that. And that's really not the story. We we've, we've grown to become one of the most diverse metro regions in the United States, and we continue to see strong diversification across many sectors, not only in aerospace but also in back office, manufacturing, professional services, and many other trades. We are very very proud of the growth um, that we've had in the aerospace aerospace sector and the defense sector. Um, as you can see through this slide, um, a lot of major linchpins that continue to add to the texture and growth of our aerospace sector. Um, the local aerospace economy is about $5 billion um, and is, uh, makes up almost 40,000 employees. You can see some of the major folks uh, that make up that overall ecosystem. We have a lot of our strength traditionally around maintenance, repair, and overhaul, but uh, that strength continues to diversify, including with some of the folks you're gonna hear from today that are bringing new manufacturing capabilities, technology capabilities, and other life cycle capabilities to the region. Um, one of the major linchpins for that growth has traditionally been uh, Tinker, uh, uh, organic uh, maintenance workload for many of our bomber platforms, uh, for uh, propulsion platforms, and also serving as the Air, uh, Air Force Sustainment Center headquarters here in Oklahoma City. Um, we're also very excited by the Air Force's announcement in 2018 that the new B-21 bomber uh, that will be ultimately produced by B-21, I'm sorry, by uh, uh, Northrop Grumman will be maintained and bed down here in Oklahoma City, adding a bunch of new capabilities. So again, just overall texture, continue to see a, a huge growth trajectory in the region. Uh, also very, you know, for us, uh, military, military extends beyond the life of someone being in uniform, uh, thinking about what their post-retirement career looks like. And we've been really um, uh, the beneficiary of having uh, folks not only live here through their um, military careers, but also um, in retirement. Um, and so that texture has also led to a lot of new business starts, uh, participation in other parts of the economy, et cetera. And then finally, and I think this, this is something I think is really key, and I think you'll have some folks talk about this on the call today, is the overall support um, from a variety of components of the, of the region where there, there's active support for uh, aviation, aerospace, and military at all levels. Uh, you know, we have a very supportive city council that has created a set of initiatives and incentives to help new technology companies start, grow, and, and stay here long-term. Um, a real strong partnership between Chamber, Alliance, and the City of Oklahoma City, but also um, a really strong support uh, from our congressional delegation to make sure that military and aerospace is supported over the city, and that we support new clusters like UAV, like UAS, like new technology. So that's just a very high-level overview. Um, and I'm gonna turn it over to Michelle Coppage, the Executive Director of the Mike Monroney Aeronautical Center of the FAA here in Oklahoma City to talk more about what they do with their 6,300 employees and almost a billion dollar contract. So Michelle, I'll turn it over to you. All right, thank you, Jeff. Well, good morning, everybody. And thank you to the Greater Oklahoma City Chamber for this opportunity to talk to you today and share a little bit about the FAA Mike Monroney Aeronautical Center located right here in Oklahoma City. So I'm Michelle Coppage, the director of the center, and I think this is a great timely topic today because we're really at a pivotal point with regards to change in the world of aerospace. In fact, it is rapidly evolving right before our eyes, and the very definition of the word aerospace is really being challenged right now. And so just in the last few months, in August, Amazon received approval from the FAA to operate its fleet of prime air delivery drones. And in June of this year, NASA announced it's seeking advanced industry partners to demonstrate advanced air mobility operations in flight, otherwise known as flying air taxis. We can't forget about space operations. Uh, they've become increasingly important with the new space task force and the increase in commercial space operations as well. So these changes are not just occurring remotely. Right here in the state, the Choctaw Nation is building an urban air mobility test site. And we have Skydweller developing renewably powered aircraft for defense and commercial industries. 
and Kratos building tactical drones for defense and security systems. And so you're gonna hear more about those today. But our job as an FAA is to be able to integrate all of these current users and the future new users and the ascent vehicles seamlessly into our national airspace system. And this includes any combination of aircraft, the drones, the balloons, uh, and space vehicles, even future vehicles and aircraft that haven't yet been imagined. And so our challenge is to integrate all of these entrants into the current system that we have right now, which is pretty complex. And so this is going to take a lot of collaboration, a lot of coordination. This is where the expertise of the FAA Mike Monroney Aeronautical Center is a really important asset to the state. The Aeronautical Center can be described as a large operational and research arm for the FAA. And so when you think about the center, it's really, it's the largest FAA facility outside of Washington, D.C., and it encompasses a lot of acres. You can see on the picture, it's 1,100 acres, it's 138 buildings, and over 3.3 million square feet of industrial, lab, classroom, and administrative space. Um, as Jeff mentioned, we have 6,300 federal and contract employees with an annual operating budget of over $1 billion and a pretty large economic impact. The mission of the center is to make sure that we have the safest and most effective national airspace system and that it can accommodate all these new entrants and new users safely, both here in the U.S., but also influence that internationally. And so when you think about our mission, I guess it's somewhat intuitive that we provide support to the FAA, but many people may not be aware that we also support the entire Department of Transportation, and we're also a shared service provider across government supporting 37 different federal agencies. So because we have so much diverse function, one of the best ways to describe our functions at the center is to think about all aspect, aspects of flight when you fly. The center touches every single step from ascent to descent. In fact, the majority of the functions that we perform at the center are unique and they're accomplished nowhere else across the FAA. So I want you to think about the next time you go to the airport and you get ready to board a flight, before you arrive that plane, it was already inspected by an aviation safety inspector. Well, that safety inspector was trained at the Aeronautical Center. The plane has a registration on the tail number and the registration of that plane and the registration of the nation's civil aircraft and the certification of airmen were all performed at the Aeronautical Center in the Civil Aviation Registry. And as you think about getting on the plane, the flight attendant starts to talk to you about all the safety briefings and they're going to explain, hey, here's the, how the drop-down oxygen mask system work, and the safety placards behind the seat, talking about the flotation devices and the seat belts, and also the aisle lighting, which ensures that the passengers can safely evacuate. Well, did you know that all of that was researched and developed at the Civil Aerospace Medical Institute right here in Oklahoma City? They, they, they are a world-renowned research facility located on the center. And as the pilots start to take off, they're of course gonna to talk to the air traffic controllers. All of those controllers for the FAA were trained at the Aeronautical Center at the FAA Academy. The flight procedures that they use were developed by specialists from the flight procedures and airspace group at the center. And as the pilot starts to progress en route to their destination, the majority of the equipment that they use both at the airport and as they fly across the nation which includes like the radars, the navigational aid equipment, the instrument landing, the end pavement lighting, and even the co communications equipment. Um, that was all repaired, maintained, and distributed across the NAS by the FAA Logistics Center. The Logistics Center, which is located at Oklahoma City, operates 24 seven, and they are the only organic supply support for the agency for the FAA. And all of this equipment, once it gets sent out to the NAS, somebody has to install it and maintain that. And that's done by engineers and technicians that were trained at the, at the Aeronautical Center. And also, we have to have it flight checked. So we have a flight program operations team at Oklahoma City that flight checks all the equipment to make sure it's operating appropriately before it's turned on for use. So as you can see, the MMAC touches all aspects of aviation. But the real strategic advantage of the Aeronautical Center that I want you to know is the co-location that we have of every line of business across the FAA being located in one spot right here in Oklahoma. All of this talent and all this experience available at one location allows us to really quickly work together in tandem to try to solve problems. 
And the center is very unique in that aspect. There's actually over 95% of all the national airspace system equipment in the field replicated right here in Oklahoma City at the center. And the benefit of this infrastructure or the value is $2 billion. There's no other FAA location or company in the world that has this amount of NAS infrastructure available or in use. This equipment is shared between all the different lines of business. And so having it co-located and having us be able to share it allows us to really kind of replicate a lot of the things that would happen exactly in the field. So we benefited a lot of partnerships and people like to work with the center because of this. And one of the partnerships recently formed that recognized this advantage is with NASA. So I'm really thrilled that the MMAC is now uh, partnering with NASA and we have a NASA presence on the center and we're working together on multiple fronts to support the NASA grand challenge for urban air mobility. So some of you may be wondering, so why Oklahoma? Why do we have everything here in this state? Well, there's several reasons for that. One is that we have a very strong talent pool right here in the state. There's excellent resource pipelines through multiple universities to get that talent. And our strength at the Aeronautical Center is really coming from our people who work very, very closely with academia in a lot of ways, like through capstone programs and through other uh, new degree programs like an aerospace MBA program that we worked on recently and a center of excellence programs to drive innovation and new ideas and new talent. We've also had great community support. The chamber has been incredible in their support of aerospace and we're working together uh, through the Oklahoma Department of Commerce Aerospace uh, Economic Services Board, known as ACES, to ensure that Oklahoma has a strong pipeline of future employees to help with some of the challenges of the future. Uh, we've also appreciated a real strong support from the Oklahoma Aeronautics Commission. Uh, they work very closely with the FAA on airport expansion programs and grants, and they also work closely with state legislation on legislation that will benefit the aerospace industry and the community, such as the Oklahoma Engineering Tax Credit, which encouraged engineers to come or stay in Oklahoma after graduation, which helps us to be able to uh, get and retain talent. So, but, you know, all of the stuff that we do, the bottom line is we, like most companies, can't really do all this work by ourselves. We have a lot of contracts and we need a lot of support to support the goals of the center. And so I wanted to let you know that just in fiscal year 20, the center awarded $493 million in contracts. And of this 493 million, about half of this went to small business. And of the total, there was about 30% of that that went to Oklahoma businesses. So us having partnerships with other companies is really key to our success. Now I mentioned that we're really large. And next year, we're actually going to be celebrating our 75th anniversary. And you may be wondering, well, how did, you, how did the center get so big? Well, we have grown to have a very large aerospace footprint in the state because of a great cost structure that is available from being in Oklahoma. This cost structure has enabled us to actually expand our services to 37 different federal agencies. And in turn, all of those agencies have also benefited from the Oklahoma cost advantages and our expertise at the center. So we really do have a large footprint. We have great talent and we have a very favorable cost structure and a lot of community support. But our challenge going forward is to really transform from a model of traditional air traffic control to really moving forward with air traffic management while safely incorporating new entrants such as advanced air mobility and unmanned aerial systems and even commercial space transportation. And this transition cannot really be a slow evolution. It has to be fast. Industry and the flying public demand and expect us to have the same continuous safety and efficiencies that they've come to know. And those that don't change and adapt are really gonna be left behind as we move forward. So thank you. Thank you, Michelle. What a great overview of a very, very robust infrastructure that the FAA has here. And thank you for your longstanding partnership um, I know all of us benefit by um, FAA's presence and the partnerships uh, regionally and statewide. So thank you so much. Um, our next speaker is uh, someone that can, I think, attest to that partnership with the FAA on, on many levels. Um, so I want to uh, take a little bit of time to introduce Steve Finley. So Steve is the president of Kratos Unmanned Systems Division. 
Uh, we've been working with Steve for several years as they have started, launched, and are now in the process of expanding operations here in Oklahoma City. So Steve, I'll turn it over to you to tell your story. Great, thank you, Jeff, and good morning, everybody. Great job, Michelle, and, and a great segue for me because our partnership with the Monroney Center and with Michelle has been a, a great help to us throughout our, and I'll talk about two real things here, our initial decision to expand to Oklahoma, and then our continuing decision to continue expanding in Oklahoma. And I'll share my slides now, and we'll, we'll talk a little bit about Kratos, why we came here, and why we're continuing to expand. So first, a little bit about the company. So Kratos is the affordable alternative. It's interesting. We're a, a mid-tier defense contractor, which is very unusual for a company that provides system-level products. We're the recognized affordable alternative, we believe, in this arena. And interestingly, our competition tends to be the tier one primes. Typically, companies at the mid-tier level like we are would provide subsystems, would provide support to those tier one companies. We're not, we're providing uh, full comprehensive systems directly to the government customers. And I think that's a big part of why we were attractive to Oklahoma and a big part of why we've gotten the support that we have in coming to Oklahoma and continuing to expand there. We're, uh, we're clearly the demonstrated leader in rapid development demonstration and fielding of these high technology affordable systems. And our definition of affordability really ties to what level of capability do you get versus the cost? And that's the key to being affordable in any arena, right? Because it's easy to say low cost, but really it needs to be defined with respect to affordab affordability versus the competition and versus the level of capability that you're providing. Our focus is really on leading edge technology. We are a technology company that develops systems, um, but not bleeding edge technology. So we're not a re research organization that's really focused on the, the very tip of the spear, the most complicated, the most uh, challenging technical development programs. And why is that important to us? Because it allows us to be in an area where we're very highly reliable. We can develop a system that has an incredible level of capability, but it starts off with a high level of reliability because we're not trying to be at the, at the very bleeding edge of capability. Kratos as a corporation has six divisions, the unmanned systems division, the space division, cybersecurity, strategic programs and modular systems, microwave electronics, training and simulation, and they all perform a, you know, a variety of functions and tend to, to also deliver at the system level. But what we're really gonna focus on today is unmanned systems. The unmanned systems group is the group that's established itself in Oklahoma City and the group that's developing and building these aircraft that are being produced. So a little bit of background on the company and then a little bit more about exactly what we're doing here. So we started off from a, from an unmanned aircraft perspective, we started off developing and building aerial target systems. So an aerial target system, and in our case, they're all jets. An aerial target system is used by the US military and by our foreign allies to replicate airborne threats, which could be aircraft, they could be cruise missiles or anything else that could be in the airborne arena. What this is really key for is training our troops on how to use their system, systems, training them on their tactics, and very critically, in evolving and developing new defensive systems. Our target systems are, are flown on a daily basis all over the US and all over the world to support this function. You'll see the box on the left-hand side that says aerial target systems. Again, that's our heritage, that's where we, we started, that's where the, the fundamental part of our business is. All of those aircraft are in rate production. Most significantly, the arrow points to the MQ-178 fire jet, that's the initial system that we stood up in Oklahoma. So today and this year, in the past year and a half, we've been manufacturing that aircraft, that complete aircraft system in Oklahoma City and delivering from Oklahoma City. We believe that's the first aircraft, completed aircraft system to be produced in the state for quite some time. And we're very excited about that and we've had a lot of interest from all the groups that we work with there in that regard. 
Now, if you think about what I described for the aerial target systems and what their mission is, think about the, the base capability that those aircraft have. So they have very high subsonic speed capability, they're extremely maneuverable, and they're extremely survivable. Because as a target system, you don't actually want to shoot the airplane down every time you go fly it. What you want to do is, in some cases, demonstrate the ability for it to, uh, to evade a particular missile, for example, that's, that's fired against it. So with that basic aircraft and airframe capability, we were a very likely um, transition case to start with that baseline, incorporate some different avionics, some different mission systems, some different payloads, and now go perform another mission, which is the tactical mission. And I, I kind of chuckle, I like to say, the targets that we build are shot at, the tactical systems that we build shoot back. Um, but it's not the only purpose for the tactical system. So they can carry a weapon, but in most cases what they're doing is they're carrying systems that help identify threats, that help identify targets of interest, areas of interest, and they actually fly in conjunction typically with manned aircraft. So they're an adjunct, if you will, an off-board sensor or weapons platform to a manned aircraft. You'll see I, got a, I have a couple of arrows. One arrow points to the airwolf. The Airwolf is our tactical version of the fire jet. The basic aircraft is very similar to the fire jet, but it's configured, the avionics are configured differently, the payloads interfaces are configured differently, and it's intended to support a tactical mission. Those are built in Oklahoma City, 100% of the airplane. The other arrow points to the Valkyrie, the XQ-58. So the XQ-58 is our largest system. It is our most capable system. It's about 30 feet long, 6,000 pound gross takeoff weight. It has an internal bomb bay that can carry four small diameter bombs. It's an incredibly capable tactical system. We launched the production of that system and it's in the early stages of being established in Oklahoma City. By the middle of next year, those aircraft will be running off the production line there. Very exciting. If you look in the bottom corner there, this shows some, some pictures of where we're located. We started off in California. We still have our California basis, but we expanded to Oklahoma City just a couple of years ago and have already added 50% to our size in, in Oklahoma City just in the last couple of months. Bottom picture there you can see at the, uh, the Will Rogers Industrial Park, we're there at 151,000 square feet. And like I said, building aircraft there every day. There's a representation of the fire jet aircraft on one of its missions. So as you can see, the, the aircraft is flying, it's in a target mode. There are two missiles that are tracking the aircraft on the way to, to intercepting it, destroying it. In the top corner there, you can see our airplane is actually pulling a tow target. So in that case, our airplane is one of the targets. In addition, we're towing a smaller representation. Think of it as a cruise missile that we're towing. Now it presents a, uh, a targeting challenge for the the offensive systems of whoever's working against that target. But the point is a very, very flexible system. That aircraft is pneumatically launched. That has some significance for working with the universities in Oklahoma to develop some alternative launch methods. All of our aircraft are launched without requiring a runway. So they're, they're all runway independent. That's a very, very key capability for the target systems and for the tactical systems because any, in any kind of conflict or really just a major training exercise, we're not tying up the runways, which are, are obviously a prime resource for the military. This is a picture of the Valkyrie on one of its recent flight tests. And again, this is an extremely capable system. We think it's the future of unmanned tactical systems for the Air Force and really for the, the US military and our major allies. Um, that system, and this was announced probably a year and a half ago, but that system is being built in Oklahoma. And like I said, the production line has begun. Those will roll off around the end of the summer. A couple of quick pictures here so you can get an idea. The Valkyrie is launched with RADOS, a rocket assist system. So it has a trailer. You transport it on the trailer. The trailer articulates to an angle. You light or fire the RADOS, the rockets. They propel the aircraft to its flying speed, say roughly 200 takeoff speed, roughly 200 knots. It goes and flies the mission. When it's finished the mission, a parachute deploys. It comes down under the parachute. So neither launch nor recovery require a runway. The system is packaged in a standard shipping container. Why is that significant? That's significant because you can ship these all over the world. You can forward deploy them. You can emplace them. 
and even satellites won't know that it's an aircraft system like this, a tactical aircraft system. So some very unique features about our tactical systems that are uh, that, that we think are game changers in the industry, and certainly the, the Pentagon has responded in, in kind. When did we come to Oklahoma? So we've hired our first employee in Oklahoma in about the fourth quarter of 2017. Shortly thereafter, just a couple of months later, we opened an engineering office. A couple of months after that, we identified the manufacturing facility, but, but fast forward through that, we, from the fourth quarter of 2018 to today, we're in position with our second production line that's ramping up again, and, and I keep harping on it because we're so proud of it, building complete aircraft, aircraft systems. Uh, very proud of that. What's our impact to Oklahoma? Really, it's jobs, 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 and more jobs. Um, we, Michelle, I wish I had gone first because we pale in comparison to, to what the Monroney Center does with respect to jobs, but we're proud for the, for the part that we're doing. We'll be at over 350 employees or adding another 350 employees over the next five years. We are, we are in rate production. We've just expanded the factory. In addition to producing aircraft there, we'll be doing systems integration and tests. Um, these are, you know, one of the interesting things because we build the whole airplane and it, it comes off the line there, we need engineers, we need technicians, we need assemblers, we need composites technicians, we need electricians, electronics engineers. It's, it's the range, we need program managers, we need all the administrative staff to support it. So it, it's really the range of professional, technical, and labor capabilities to, to develop and build these systems. The, uh, the capital investment that we've made so far is eight million with another 10 million in work as part of our current expansion. Why did we pick Oklahoma? And, and I'll tell you, I'll start off with this. Not only why did we pick it, but why are we so happy that we're there and why are we continuing to expand? Because really, if you think about it, for no longer than we've been there, we're already making great strides and significant expansion. And the reason is for the support and the trusted relationships. This is from the, the federal, state, and city political level, from the state and city chambers, the, the basic uh, aerospace growth and focus from the, the state at large has been huge in what we're doing. The Burns Flat Spaceport, we're working on being able to fly there. Obviously, Michelle Coppage and her team at the Monroney Aeronautical Center have been a great help. Our partnership opportunities and, and initial efforts with Tinker and the other local aerospace companies, and then of course, all of the incentives. Uh, many, many incentives which were attractive to us to come to Oklahoma. And on top of that, a pool of qualified candidates and maybe most significantly, the, the cost and standard of living. It's fantastic there. It's very interesting. We thought, you know, our home base is in California. And when we opened in Oklahoma, one of our concerns was, will we ever get any of the key people that we really want to transition from California to Oklahoma to go? And let me tell you, it's been easy. We, we have people on a daily basis asking us, can they transition? So what's the bottom line? I included a, a quote that was from a, a mid-2018 interview, and the reason that's significant is it's still true today. Those were all the reasons why we picked Oklahoma in the first place, but I can tell you the continued support, the continued engagement has been incredible. We don't have to reach out. Everyone that supported in Oklahoma, that supported us coming to Oklahoma, reaches out to us on a daily basis and says, how can we help? What can we do? We see, we just saw a news release that you were bringing this new airplane. How can we we help make that possible? How can we help um, with the, the local regulations that will allow you to run an engine in that industrial park, which is one of our challenges, and all of those things. So bottom line, we can't thank the community, the chambers, the government officials, and our industry partners enough. It's, uh, it's really been, it's a fantastic decision to begin with, and that's reinforced to us truly on a daily basis. So thank you so much for your time this morning. Thank you, Steve. What great comments and what a great story. We're just continue to be excited about your continued ability to expand here. So, um, yeah, just look forward to seeing more of those things go up in the sky. <laughs> Excellent. Thank you. So I want to transition real quick, um, and I'm going to use it as a segue to talk about the reasons that Steve described for uh, Kratos being here. And I think that'll match really well with some of the reasons I think Robert will describe as, as far as why Skydwellers here in Oklahoma City you know, a comprehensive package, not only of 
incentives, which we all know are important, but also personality, people, and support. So, Robert, I want to talk uh, toss it to you to talk about the Sky Dollar story. Um, it's a real pleasure, um, and it's and it's good to be coming back to Oklahoma. Um, Oops, Robert, you you cut off. You're mute. Oh, hold on. Uh, right. Can you hear me now? Yep, we got you. Okay, so thank you. Oh, you're off again. Somebody keeps, okay, how's that? I'm not touching anything, so yeah. is that better? Okay. Good. Now you're off. <laughs> Somebody, are you guys automatically muting? Because I'm not touching anything. So there we go. Okay. Who's the, okay. Well, we keep trying this. Okay. Oh. How's that? There we go. Okay. So like I said, it's, it's, it's great to be back in Oklahoma. Um, you know, my background, I've been in the aerospace defense business for almost 30 years. Uh, was it Northrop there, Greg, for a while? Uh, out of Palmdale, Rancho, El Segundo. Um, and, and, and Steve, we did some targets work there with you guys too as well, or I've done targets work with you guys in the past, I think before you, when it was CEI. Um, and, we had the opportunity, uh, I had the opportunity to, with my co-founder, to acquire the assets and all the intellectual property of uh, Solar Impulse, which was uh, the first aircraft to fly around the world. Um, we're uh, an aerospace startup. We are developing the first commercially viable uh, pseudo satellite. So this is an aircraft that's gonna fly for 30 to 90 days um, and it's gonna, because of that capability, it really has some unique aspects when it comes to supplying um, capabilities to our customers, which are in the government surveillance market, uh, commercial communications market, geospatial, maritime surveillance, uh, land-based surveillance. Um, and, you know, the team that we, we've got together represent, um, you know, aerospace ranging from 15 to 35 years, the leadership, um, some very, very experienced people. Um, Greg, we brought the, uh, Ted Shulman from, for instance, who's coming, he's a tech, he was a tech fellow at, at Northrop, uh, retired from Northrop to join us. So we really got kind of a, a, an A plus team here that uh, we're bringing. Um, and we're a little bit different than Steve. We are, we represent the, the bleeding edge, the cutting edge of stuff. This is uh, the kind of jobs that we're gonna be initially bringing to Oklahoma. Eventually we'll be doing uh, manufacturing and assembly there, but these are, these are cutting edge jobs. These are jobs that uh, uh, we're trying to do stuff that nobody's ever done before. So, and that's exciting. That's uh, doing an aviation first. Um, we're working with, uh, the University of Oklahoma, both on weather prediction um, and some of the, ra the, the radar lab down there to really help bring technologies that are going to help us accomplish this mission of flying for 30 to 90 days. Um, and, uh, you know, I'll go back to it. Some of the same things that uh, uh, Steve talked about brought us to Oklahoma is the executive uh, leadership of the state of Oklahoma. I mean, Governor Stitt, as like I said, you know, he keeps reaching out, how can we help? How can we help? And that's so important when you're a startup. Um, the, the Department of Commerce, the Oklahoma City Chamber of Commerce, they have been just absolutely fantastic helping us stand up. Um, we're following kind of uh, Kratos' thing. We've just started to hire people. So we've hired about eight people in Oklahoma. Um, we're still trying to figure out exactly where we're putting our, our headquarters and uh, engineering facilities in uh, Oklahoma City. Uh, we're looking forward to, we've already had some discussions with the FAA about what it's gonna uh, take to fly, um, both with the Moroni Center and, and the, the field office in Dallas, because 
where we'll, we'll probably be in Southern Oklahoma doing the flying. Um, so, you know, it's, it's that culture of the can do. And if you look at our aircraft, so the aircrafts, this is not a, a, a small aircraft. This is a, a 236 foot wingspan aircraft and weighs less than your, your F-150. So it's a wingspan of a 747, weighs less than your 150, uh, F-150, and basically can fly for 90 days. So this could fly around the world multiple times without stopping. This is, uh, and so we're, we're terribly excited to be in Oklahoma uh, from that perspective. Um, and the kind of stuff that we can, we can bring to Oklahoma, like I said, it's, it's, we're bringing jobs, but there's not just any kind of jobs. These are, these are cutting edge first of uh, people who are going to be working on an aviation first, something that's never been done before. Um, and, you know, our initial launch customers is very excited uh, about us being in the state of Oklahoma. Um, they, they know the history there, you know, going back to Wiley Post that, you know, Oklahomans have, have been involved with aviation first since the very beginning. And we hope to continue that tradition in, in Oklahoma. Um, so, and that's what I, thank you very much for today. No, we're, we're excited. Um, I think you and Steve both represent what we're trying to build here in the region, which is capabilities beyond just maintenance, repair and overhaul. And really, as you said, moving into the bleeding edge of where aerospace is headed, both of you. So both of your companies, just thank you for your continued investment and partnership. Uh, one of the other uh, speakers that we wanted to bring to the table was uh, someone who is uh, really fresh to Oklahoma City on a lot of different levels. Um, recently took a corporate relocation to Oklahoma City for Northrop Grumman. Uh, Greg uh, Musser is a manager of software engineering at Northrop Grumman and we wanted to spend maybe just five or six minutes hearing Greg's story and then we're going to transition to some Q&A that's popped up in the chat. So Greg, maybe five or six minutes about your story. Yes. Um, first of all, I'd like to say uh, this is directed at, at Robert and Steve. I'm hoping you guys give tours of your facilities because that is very interested, interesting and, and I would love to come to, to see that stuff. Um, as far as my story, so to put things in perspective, I moved to Southern California in 1985 and then to Los Angeles and then to San Diego in 2001. My wife was born and raised there. So it was no trivial decision for us to leave. But over the last couple of years, we'd been a little disenchanted with the culture change in, in California and the direction the state was moving and decided we wanted to, to look at uh, other locations. And at the time, Northrop brought bought Orbital ATK in Phoenix. And I always loved Phoenix. So I decided, well, it's time to probably relocate. Unfortunately, Orbital was going through some um, issues with, with hiring uh, positions and hiring. So nothing ever materialized there. So I started looking at Melbourne, Florida. And the more I looked and talked to people, they kept telling me, you really should check out Oklahoma City. And I knew nothing about Oklahoma City, so my, my response was generally no. Um, and I, I kept hearing enough of that that my wife and I finally decided we're going to spend a week in Florida and a week in Oklahoma City and make the decision. And I'll admit it was, it was a tough decision, but in the end, Oklahoma City won out and we came here. In fact, since, since I made the decision to move and, and publicly announced it, um, I've had two responses from people, people that know nothing about Oklahoma. Um, when I told them I was moving from San Diego would say, are you crazy? But people who were familiar with Oklahoma said just the opposite and that they wish they could do it too. Um, I came out here March 1st and started working and my wife stayed behind to sell the house and, and take care of the kids and so forth. Um, so she's been out here only about a month. And the longer I'm out here, the, the more I realize that this is a better location for me than, than Florida. So I'm glad I made the decision. My wife is, is enjoying being out here also um, for different reasons. But um, you know, my biggest challenge here is probably going to keep this in the, the five or six minutes because I can talk for hours on, on what I love about Oklahoma City. Um, you know, one of the obvious things is the cost of living. The cost of living 
from a housing perspective is about a third of what it was in San Diego where we lived. Um, you know, people, the, the whole culture out here is different. Uh, you know, that's one reason we left LA is we didn't wanna raise kids in that culture. So we moved to San Diego, which is much more family oriented area, but it was still having, you know, not, uh, or has effects of, of the California culture. And it, it just started getting, to the point where it was catching up to LA and, and we decided we wanted to get out. Um, it's funny, coming out here, I thought I was gonna have to give up doing a lot of the things that, that I enjoy doing. And, but after I'd made the decision, I saw a video put out by the Oklahoma State uh, branding video, which talked about the diversity of the land here. And after I saw that, even though I'd already made the decision, was committed to coming out here and, and wanting to, um, I became more excited because all the things that I love to do that I thought I was going to have to give up, I found out I could do out here. There is so much to do out here. Um, everything from, I was, you know, we did a lot of desert dirt bike and quad riding and I had figured I'd have to give up sand dunes and a, and, and a lot of those things. And then I saw Little Sahara, which is, I don't know how big it is, but my daughter and I went riding out there one day in the sand dunes and we rode for over an hour and never even got to the other side. So it, it's quite large. Um, water sports, there's a lot of lakes and rivers here. I'm into jet skiing, water skiing, boating, and everywhere you look, there's a lot of lakes. And the big difference between the water out here and the water in San Diego is San Diego is very crowded. Here, you actually have room to do things. One of the things I thought I was gonna give up is rock climbing in mountains. But uh, after watching the video and learning about um, some of the, the mountains here, I, I realized that I don't have to give all that up. Um, scuba diving is another thing, but I've heard some of the lakes here, Ten Killer and a few others are clear enough where people actively scuba dive there. So besides the, the great opportunities for work, there's also great opportunities for all the, the things that I enjoy doing. Um, and, and one thing, you know, as we travel back and forth that I really have to say is your airport here is fantastic. Getting through LAX or San Diego airport to travel can sometimes be a nightmare. The one here is, is just the easiest thing to, to get through. So, um, you know, every day I'm here, I, I learn new things about Oklahoma that make me very happy that I chose this over Florida or anywhere else. Well, Greg, we're really happy to have you here. Um, uh, more, more and more of that story is what we're hoping to create. So um, let us know how we can help and also let us know when you're ready to go fishing. I'm, uh, I'm yeah, I needed to start doing that. Um, we, we, one of the things we were able to do because of the cost of living here is move our RV out to Lake Eufaula. Nice. And uh, um, it's right on the water there. And we try to get out there most weekends to, to, to do that. So it's, uh, it's been good. I, you know, when I was in San Diego, I worked on Triton unmanned aerial vehicle for 10 years and I had a bunch of different roles. And so it was, it was not an insignificant decision to make, but it's one that I'm very glad I did. Well, we appreciate it. I think for everyone has seen some things pop up in the chat. Hopefully you get a chance to click on some of those links and see things that I think would surprise most people about Oklahoma City. Uh, downtown Whitewater Rapids facility for the U.S. Olympics here in downtown Oklahoma City. Um, all kinds of things I think that would surprise you from an investment standpoint uh, over the things that we've done in the last 25 years. So Thank you, Greg, that's a great story. I'm gonna to transition to some of the questions that have popped up. One quick question that came up uh, was about the ecosystem. Where do we wanna go moving forward? And I think the short answer is more of this. We want more of these kind of stories to tell. We want more Kratos uh, and more success for them, more sky dwellers and, and then support and growth and for folks like Michelle, Northrop Grumman, Tinker, and just a more robust ecosystem overall. We know a lot of that is our ability to not only have incentives, but also the right people. So a real strong focus on making long-term talent pipelines available in the Metro. So uh, one other question that popped up and I'm gonna, I'm gonna talk to Michelle first on this and we'll just do a quick, quick, uh, quick response is talk to us about the impact of COVID on, on your business. And then I'll ask the same question to Robert and Steve. Yes, sure, Jeff. So, uh... 
you know, COVID's been an interesting challenge, obviously, but uh, we've actually been pretty successful throughout this COVID period. We never completely shut the center. We have uh, mission critical operations still going, and we have an average of 1,800 people coming on center every single day. And so uh, we have good protocols in place. And so those are more of the touch labor, the things where you have to be um, handling equipment um, directly. But the other people, you might wonder, so what's going on with the rest of the employees? Well, they've successfully transitioned to a telework status. And so we really very quickly moved out of that just survival mode into um, more of a thriving mode and have been able to move forward on a lot of our projects and initiatives. And so um, what we're really doing now is talking about, okay, how do we really even streamline further? And how do we take some of the lessons learned through this pandemic and really implement those as uh, the pieces that are best practices going forward to help make us even more cost effective? And so. Thank you, Michelle. That's great. That's great. Steve, do you mind if I toss to you next? Definitely. So very interesting. I, uh, it's, it's kind of funny. I had an all hands yesterday and my comment in the all hands was somebody should have bet me because I always, I always lose my bets, which is kind of depressing, but I do. And I would have bet early on in, in the March, April timeframe, I'd have said, we're going to all be past this by about the middle of summer. There will be, you know, either because the infection rate will go down or there will be some cures identified, something, it'll go away. So I described that time, I described it as a hurdle. What I talked about in my uh, all hands yesterday was, it's not a hurdle. This thing is a marathon obstacle course. So it's a very early on, we had to make a decision and we're, we're building airplanes, right? So we have a lot of touch labor people. We, a lot of the work that we're doing is physical. The engineers can telework to some extent, the administrative people can telework to some extent, and we've certainly uh, adopted bits and pieces of that. But we have, thank, you know, thank goodness that we have people who are committed like they are. They've all worked with us, all, all of our staff, to come up with how do we maintain our effectiveness? How do we continue to design and build these airplanes um, and not shut the doors? Because we actually thought about shutting the factory down for a month or two, and thank goodness we didn't because there would have been nothing to suggest we can open it again. Um, so basically we instituted all of the all of the protocols that are, let's call them the national standard, right? Some, some states have some very, very restrictive protocols and we have not done those. Oklahoma is one of the much more reasonable, I would say, but we implemented those protocols. We've kept our people safe. We actually have had a, a couple of cases, and thank goodness, because we compartmentalized how we have run the operation, we've been able to to have no element of our operation shut down for more than about 48 hours during the whole pandemic. And, and our people are very thankful. In fact, they have all come to us and said, we're so thankful that you didn't shut down and we didn't have to go you know, sit at home and worry about our next paycheck, so. Thanks, Steve, that's, that's great. Robert, do you wanna talk about your story? Yeah, so we have uh, locations both in Madrid, Spain, and in Oklahoma now. Um, and Madrid, Spain was hit very hard. Um, we did have to shut down for about two or three weeks, uh, about three, uh, about, it was actually a little over three weeks. Um, but luckily, um, we have structured everything so that we, we do a lot of work in the cloud. So a lot of our, our engineering, is all done in the cloud. Um, and that really enabled us to not, not lose too much time by really shifting from an at-home work, okay? Um, and then as soon as we could, we got everybody back in the office, doing a, uh, following the protocols that Steve talks about, social distancing, you know, uh, making sure everybody's using hand disinfectant all the time, um, wearing masks where, where required, um, and things like that. But I, I would say it was really how we structured the business from day one, leveraging all the modern digital technology as much as we can to, to do as much work in the cloud that really uh, uh, allowed us to continue to uh, maintain pace. Thanks, Robert. Um, and I know we were, we were managing your site location process through COVID, which was interesting in and of itself. So yeah, it was a, it was a fun project. Great. Do you want to just give a quick snippet of the Northrop environment? I see obviously you're working at the desk and I know that some of it ties to your contract types, but you want to offer your perspective? Yeah, I mean, we, we, um, we've we been pretty good here. We, we're taking a lot of precautions. I spent about half my time in the office and half time working remote. Um, I think Northrop has been very good about making sure 
all the things we can do to prevent the spread are, are being done here. So I feel I feel comfortable and safe here. Um, yeah, you know, I'll just say I've, I've been very happy with working for Northrop, and um, one of the things that limited my choices in where to relocate with is, is I wanted to stay with this company. I didn't want to leave. So I had to look, you know, that gave me three choices. Oklahoma, you know, like I said, um, Phoenix, Melbourne, and here. Um, and, and I'm glad I did because they've taken a very appropriate response to this to keep our business going forward, yet make sure people are well protected. Good. Good. It's a it's a tough uh, line to balance sometimes, but I know Northrop from our conversations has been very dedicated. I'm going to ask one final question, go around the horn here real quick, um, and that question is, what's next? What are you guys thinking about as far as the next tranche of things you're trying to accomplish here in the region? So, Michelle, I'll toss to you first. Well, we have a lot of things that's next. I mean, I think our partnership with NASA is very exciting. Um, really trying to further. Uh, everything around advanced air mobility and just making sure that we safely integrate and that we're good partners to those who are trying to be new entrants into the NAS. One thing we love most about Michelle and her team is accessibility. We're constantly in communication. We appreciate the proactive uh, way that they work with us to think about uh, what's next on their horizon. Steve, you want to talk about what's next? Yes, sir. And ours is, uh, I would say, more of the same, but it's, it's more exciting than that to me. So I'll say, more, uh, more advanced, more airplanes, more development, uh, more development work in Oklahoma. So we're transitioning more and more of the development work there. And, and I would say keep your eyes peeled in the next 18 to 24 months for two new airplanes that are going to start showing up there and ultimately be in production. So our, our what's next is very exciting. Well, that's, we're excited about that as well. So Robert, your turn. I said we've got uh, we've got three main objectives. Um, the, the first objective is uh, grow our uh, technology relationships with OU, OSU, and TU, okay, the three major universities there in Oklahoma. Um, the second is standing up, uh, can, finishing standing up our engineering organization there um, and getting that really underway. And three, um, really exploring the supplier base that we've already started to um, I'll say send out RFIs, RFPs to uh, different smaller companies in uh, Oklahoma and some larger companies in Oklahoma who are going to help us on our mission to bring uh, perpetual flight to the world. Fantastic. Very excited about that as well. Greg, you want to talk about kind of some real quick what's going on with Northrop? Anything you can share or not share? Uh, probably not a lot I can share, but um, no, it's interesting work. They're good people here. There were good people in San Diego also. I think in general, I've worked at a lot of the aerospace companies and my, you know, Northrop's not perfect, but I, I think it is the best as far as culture, the, the care that the company has for its employees, the work we do, um, it, and the opportunities we have. So, um, that that's pretty much about it. But I do want to close up with with reiterating that if, if Steve and Robert start uh, giving tours of their facilities, I want to be on that list. I'm gonna we'll share your business card out. Absolutely. Um, so the final one quick question that came across the chat was the need for a, a drone dedicated airport. To be honest, I don't think I have a great answer for that. Maybe you guys have somebody else wants to chime in, but I will tell you that. From a focus perspective, we're very focused on creating the right infrastructure, policies, and programs that continue to support the growth of the UAS and UAV industry. So if anybody wants to add to that response, I'm happy to take it. Well, I can tell you, we'd be pretty excited about a drone dedicated airport. We're working very hard to be able to fly up north there. And uh, yeah, so, so what I would say to that is if there's anything we can do to help enable that, we're we're very motivated, very interested. I think it makes a lot of sense. I think it's an, I think that opportunity is out there for and let's say a state for some state to decide we're going to be the one. A little bit different than the test centers. The test centers, the UAS test centers are very focused on really. I think some of the smaller airplanes, and less capable systems, more like yes. a little bit bigger than quadcopters. But you know the the Group One stuff. Um, I, I think there's a great opportunity there for the first state that decides they're going to seriously go after that. Thanks, oh, I agree with Steve uh, 110% on that. You know, you need, 
we're, I've got a wingspan of a 747, so I just can't land at any any airport. I need a, a fairly substantial, or at least a wide runway, not a very long one, but, uh, um, and uh, I'm sure Greg's, uh, some of the drones that Greg uh, has been involved with, those are, uh, require even more space. Um, and I think, um, I think the state of Oklahoma would do itself a, a big favor if they established uh, a, a drone airport. So, and there's there's lots of uh, locations around the state um, that it would it, it would be a nice fit. So, I just got a chat from one of our uh, friends over at the state that said that one of the conversations that's an interim study right now is the UAS infrastructure overall. So, I know there's a lot of a lot of eyes on that conversation right now. Michelle, if you want to chime into that question, feel free, or, or you can not if you don't want to. Uh, I, I think I think the need's obviously very clear. I think we have a great opportunity. We have a, a pretty good site that I think most people are probably thinking about that would uh, be very beneficial to convert that site if the state agrees. Something like Burns Flat, you know, so. It's great to have options. Well, with that, I want to close. I want to thank everybody that participated in the panel discussions, that participated in the webinar and also to the UAS Cluster Initiative for serving as our host today. So thank you, everybody. Um, there's some individual questions that have popped up in the chat. We're gonna do our best to uh, share out slides and contact information for a lot of additional follow-up. So thank you, everyone. Thank you. Thanks, Jeff. Thank you.